A couple months ago, we released our Stardew Valley Spouses Good to Evil video, and it got a lot more traction than we expected. We loved seeing how viewers stood up to defend their virtual wives and husbands. But Pelican Town is a rich environment filled with lots of characters besides just love interests. Some of them are hardworking members of the community, while others have more questionable roles in the town. Today, we'll be ranking Stardew Valley NPCs from good to evil. For this list, we'll be looking at the best and worst traits of the Pelican Town residents. This means we won't be including Ginger Island NPCs, unfortunately. We'll also not be including any potential spouses as they've already been ranked in their own video. We'll be taking into account cutscenes, dialogue options, and general contributions of the community. We will do our best to avoid theories and conjectures, though we'll be the first to admit there's a bit of overlap. Keep in mind, we're ranking characters from good to evil, not best to worst. As such, we'll do our best to refrain from letting our own personal feelings sway our ranking of our favorite and most entertaining NPCs. Finally, this should go without saying, but there are definitely some spoilers ahead, so if you're not done with the storyline or are still chasing after that endgame content, consider this your warning. First, we'll be looking at the good characters. These are the characters we feel consistently demonstrate strong values in Pelican Town. Generally speaking, these are also the characters with the most consistency and the fewest problematic mechanics. Taking the gold medal of good is Gus. Like all residents of the town, the owner of the Stardrop Saloon is human and has his faults. We're going to address his biggest downfall first, his profits. We love that Gus is a hard worker. He dedicates himself to providing food and entertainment for the residents of Pelican Town, sometimes to his own detriment. We learn through one of his cutscenes that the saloon is actually suffering financially because he's so generous and especially lenient with bar tabs. But when it comes to his regulars, this idea of keeping the saloon open makes him a bit of an enabler. He thinks his establishment will go out of business if Pam and Clint stop drinking. He'll be the first to admit that Pam should cut down and Clint only seems to be there for Emily. A few of his dialogue options show he's aware that the hardships of these two citizens keep him afloat. Still, we know from watching Gus that despite not phrasing these thoughts the best, he puts the welfare of the people above his profits. It's seen through his actions, if not his words. He's reluctant to confront Pam about how much money she owes, and even when asking for your help, he wants you to break the news gently to spare her feelings. Friendship points are lost with him if you're too abrupt or aggressive with her. In one of his earliest cutscenes, we also see him providing a warm meal to Linus, where he states he wouldn't want anyone in the town to ever go hungry. Finally, let us not forget that he's quite generous with you as the player character. He's one of the first NPCs to send you home-cooked meals and recipes, even if your interactions with him are minimal. Taking this silver medal of good is the wizard, aka Rasmodius. We often think about the wizard as being a bit strange and perhaps even standoffish. He's not one for socializing like so many of the other NPCs, and there are a couple of pretty major skeletons in his closet. These include things like making a, a mistake that led to his ex-wife hexing people at random, and the implication that he had an affair with one of the villagers. He admits he has reason to suspect someone in town is actually his daughter, and though it's not confirmed to whom, a fan theory is that it's Abigail. That would certainly change our ranking of Abigail's mother, were it to be confirmed. Now, those are some pretty big scandals, but those make up the only reason we didn't give him the number one spot, which he did very nearly earn. We don't think any other NPC has as big of an impact on the story, especially if you complete the community center arc. Rasmodius gives you the magical abilities required to read the writings of the Junimos, after all, and that's what sets the whole thing in motion. Even if you're the one doing the heavy lifting and helping send the adorable little forest spirits back home, it wouldn't have been possible if the local wizard didn't have their back. Taking the bronze medal of good is Demetrius. Demetrius isn't perfect, but a lot of the worst things about him are quirks more than full-on faults. He sees the world differently than the average person, and this adds communication challenges into his life. This is something we actually see him working through in his relationship to Robin during one of the cutscenes. We think it's incredibly sweet how he acknowledges her frustration and continues trying to evolve in order to strengthen their relationship. While he can get awfully caught up in his work, that work largely entails helping out the ecosystems of the community. I think we can all agree that that's a worthwhile effort. It can also be directly beneficial to you as well, like when he gets permission to set up a study on your property. The one thing that does keep him from being higher up on our list is how overbearing he can be about his daughter. We understand wanting to vet the romantic partner of a family member, but pretty early into your relationship with Maru, he tries to warn you of holding her back. 
It's a little condescending to you as the player character, not to mention the pressure that sort of attitude must put on Maru herself. It's worth noting that if you continue that romance, he does eventually come around, another sign of his capacity for personal growth. After him is Willy. Like many of the characters to make it this high up on our list, Gus being the notable exception, Willy's contributions to the story help you mechanically in the game. The big one, of course, is that he teaches you how to fish and supplies you with the basic fishing rod you need to get yourself started. A lot of his quests are also very wholesome. While some NPCs have you tracking down obscure items for them, Willy mostly just wants to keep the art of fishing alive. It makes him a sweet and consistent character, just wanting to pass on his trade to someone who might be interested. Fishing is an important part of the game, and Willy opens up that door for you out of the goodness of his heart. He might have made it higher on the list were it not for the Ginger Island access, a point of annoyance for many players and a potential injustice against the player character. In what is largely considered to be the endgame content, players can help Willy fix his boat to grant access to Ginger Island. The controversy here is that tickets are 1000 G each time you want Willy to take you to the island. It's a reasonable enough price until you consider just how much money you had to pour into that boat to get it working for him. Repairs include 200 hardwood, 5 battery packs, and 5 iridium bars. That's over 10,000 G in materials alone that you donate to him. So the ticket price rubs a lot of players the wrong way, especially on days when he's already making the trip to shuttle other NPCs. But mechanically, there's no way for you to get the ride for free. Usually by this point in the game, the price tag of 1000 G isn't prohibitive, but it is annoying. Especially since the profit maximizers are going to be going to Ginger Island a lot. With that one annoyance out of the way, we still have to admit he's pretty great. Up next though is Linus. Now he's a strange character, one that we can't help but love. Linus is also a favorite target of fan theories because of his more ambiguous past, but remember, we're not here to speculate. So let's look at the facts. He lives off the land in a way that's different from the other members of the community. Though he isn't the most prosperous person in Pelican Town, he is happy to share what little he has with you once you get to know him. He might not have the biggest impact on the story, but he's always kind, collected, and eager to pass on what he's learned about nature. This goes as far as adopting Leo later on in the game and giving him a place to stay that's closer to the nature of the valley. Following him is Evelyn. She doesn't have the biggest impact on the town, but she has the patience of a saint. For evidence of this, just remember that she is married to George. Kidding, kidding. There are plenty of reasons why Evelyn is on the list. From a mechanics perspective, she doesn't offer much to the player character. In fact, you'd be able to go most of the game barely interacting with her, unless you are trying for a completionist route of the game, which would require you to gain her friendship. But she is one of the easiest NPCs to befriend, and her personality absolutely shines through in each line of dialogue she has. She gives you permission to call her Granny the very first time you meet her. She appreciates your gifts and will even let you in on her secret recipes once you increase your hearts with her. One of the most touching things about Evelyn is how she looks after her grandson Alex once her daughter passes away. She's lived in Stardew Valley all her life and is an outstanding example of what Pelican Town has to offer. And speaking of very patient spouses, our next spot goes to Jody. When her husband Kent goes off to war, she's left to take care of their two sons on her own. Since they may actually be the two closest siblings in all of Pelican Town, you can tell she's doing a good job raising them and instilling in them just how important family is. When Kent comes back, she's exceedingly patient with him as well. She supports and loves him while he's going through one of his most difficult times. Next up is Caroline. Caroline is another model citizen with a useful mechanic for the interested player. Once you befriend her, she'll take you to a private sunroom and give you access to it. This is an important step in the game if you're hoping to unlock all the recipes and crops, as this is where you can get your first access to tea leaves. The biggest confirmed Caroline controversy is how she treats Abigail. During one of the cutscenes, you can overhear Caroline fighting with her daughter about how she dresses. Her go-to argument seems to be that she's letting Abigail stay in the house for free while she finishes college. This is incredibly manipulative, but when Abigail calls her out, Caroline is able to admit that she was wrong. Now, growing as a person is a big theme in some of the Stardew Valley cutscenes, but Caroline is one of the few NPCs who never backslides. We also commend her for the patience she must have to be married to Pierre, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's just say that we understand why she needs a private sunroom. Wrapping up the good tier are Jazz and Vincent. The children of Stardew are tied for this spot. While both of them can seem disinterested in the world around them, they get passes because they're children. They're also both dealing with a lot in their lives at home. 
Jazz is being raised by her aunt and godfather who struggles with alcoholism. Vincent has to deal first with his father's absence and then eventual PTSD. While Vincent and his home life seem a bit more developed, we think both children play a similar role in the game and that they deserve to be considered good. Next up, we have the Grey. These are the characters who exhibit both good and bad qualities throughout the game. We admire their struggles and their perseverance, but they have more challenges than the characters in our previous tier. First up is Marnie. Now, like with most characters in the Grey section, this is going to make some people mad. Marnie has so many excellent qualities. On paper, she's one of the best characters in the game. She deserves a lot better than some of the positions she's put into. She's also quite generous with you, sending gifts in the mail as soon as you get to a heart level of greater than zero. A lot of her dialogue options paint her as a great citizen and lover of animals, and that's actually where we start to run into trouble. Mechanically, she's one of the most frustrating characters in the game. Though her dialogue implies that if you treat your animals well, the two of you can be friends, she can be surprisingly hard to get help from when it comes to caring for your livestock. This is because her hours of operation are, to put it lightly, counterintuitive. Most players have had that feeling of frustration when the weather conditions prevent grazing, you're out of hay, and you pop over to Marnie's in the morning to pick up some feed for them. Then you realize that, because it's a Monday or Tuesday, she's not going to be home. Worst still is when you try to swing on by on your way back to the farm, only to remember she closes an hour earlier than the other establishments. Walking in to see her standing in her kitchen that entire extra hour is like a rite of passage in the game. Almost as bad as needing seeds from Pierre's on a Wednesday. Now, while it might not seem entirely fair to penalize her for this, we have to take everything into consideration. Until Marnie gets a more consistent schedule, a delivery system, or a way of dispensing emergency animal supplies on credit, we have to keep her a bit lower on the list. Especially since Gus has found a way to make such a system work for food on days that he's not tending the bar. And the hay is literally just sitting outside. You just have to look at it, taunting you, but we digress. Following her is Robin. The first time you're introduced to Robin, she's teasing you about your new house. That's not very neighborly. Though she does eventually apologize to you for this, it comes with the invitation to, well, buy things at her shop. In fact, a lot of her notes read more like ads than letters. Then there's her charity work, which often feels like a double-edged sword. While it's amazing that she's so willing to help the community and many of her ideas are inspiring, they also mean a lot of work for you as the player character. There's a big difference between fundraising for a project and assigning slash pressuring one other person to help you with that project. A great example of this is Pam's house. One of Robin's loftier charity notions is to build a house for Pam. That sounds great, right? Pam lives with her daughter in a trailer and building her a house seems like a great thing to do. Robin even puts in the hours of work to make the house herself if you gather the supplies. That seems fair on the surface until you realize that you're actually paying for her service as well. 950 pieces of wood is a lot, and you're also paying 500,000 to Robin, which means she's not supplying the materials, nor the time, for free. When you compare this to the other house and building upgrades, it certainly seems like she's turning a hefty profit off of what was pitched as a good deed. That being said, mechanically speaking, she is one of the greatest assets in all of Pelican Town. She actually has reliable business hours and can get you anything you need built completed within three days if you have the required materials. After her is Gunther. Although he doesn't have the full NPC mechanics, we wanted to give a little shout out to Gunther at the museum. His business entirely relies on you completing a museum collection for him, and he is quick to dismiss you if you don't have anything new upon your person. That being said, he does credit you when the collection wins awards and is happy to help reward you for the items you bring him. Following him is Kent. Oh, Kent. Kent is a veteran and, besides that, an upstanding member of society. Although he is not present at the beginning of the game, we know that prior to his deployment where he helped raise Vincent and Sam. He's very reflective and self-aware. However, he is one of the few characters that we see truly have a lapse in composure. Snapping at his wife while traumatized over some popcorn. This is a part of his PTSD from the aforementioned war. While the snapping accounts against him, many characters don't have dark moments like this in the game, we have nothing but the utmost respect for his journey in overcoming that trauma. He does his best to warn Jody before he returns home that this is going to be an issue. When he does have this lapse, he apologizes and explains what he's going through as best he can. Though we never see a complete recovery in the game, we know that Kent is on a good path to easing back into a normal life 
with his loved ones. Following him is Gil. Again, here is just a little shout out to one of the less interactive NPCs. Gil is known mostly for sleeping in the Adventurer's Guild. He's a bit standoffish and only ever seems to want to talk to you if you've completed a bounty, or Marlin is making him. Still, as an adventurer, we're sure that he did a lot of protecting the town back in his prime. He'll also deliver prizes to you when you complete the laborious and often dangerous tasks of killing set amounts of enemies. While we're focusing on some out of the way characters, our next slot goes to the dwarf. Unlike Gil, the dwarf does have a heart event. There's only one and it does open up some deep lore about the war between dwarves and the shadow people, but it does exist. The dwarf is also a very useful character to know. Even if his only mechanic in the game is as a vendor, it's nice to see him slowly open up to the player character. Next up is Clint. Clint is an interesting character because you both feel sorry for him and feel like he's immensely creepy. It can be challenging for the uninterested Emily to take a hint, but also, Clint's failure to ever accurately communicate his feelings makes the situation doomed from the start. This often puts you, the player character, into uncomfortable situations where you feel pressured to involve yourself in his love life. There's also the matter of business. Clint offers you some of the most profitable and well-intentioned gathering missions. He also has a weird habit of giving you supplies to do his job at home while guilting you into not using them. A good example of this is when he's giving you the blueprints for forge machinery and hopes that it doesn't put him out of business. Thanks for the pressure, Clint! While mechanically he's not the most frustrating character and he never does anything actively harmful, there's just something about his vibe that can be extremely off-putting, especially if you're romancing Emily. Following him is none other than George. George, like Kent, has had to deal with his fair share of trauma. It puts a lot of his crankier dialogue into perspective when he does finally open up to you. Still, it's not a free pass. With so many lovely people in Pelican Town trying to make you feel at home, we have to mention that George is the only one who's actively rude to you this often in the game. Aside from Shane, who has his own demons and is not on the list. Rounding out the great tier is Pam. Pam has one of the greatest struggles in the game. She, like Shane, struggles with alcoholism. Unlike Shane, she has a daughter to look after and her rehabilitation arc is less impressive. Penny is old enough to help take care of things at the house herself, but it's obvious that the trailer brings her shame. The sad thing is wondering how long it's been like that. A young woman taking care of a drunk mother in a trailer is one thing, but a teenager being forced to do it while struggling to take pride in their ramshackle home is enough to really tug at the heartstrings. Still, we do see Pam get put on the right path to an extent in the endgame content. Even Gus admits that he doesn't believe she'll cut down on her drinking, but she does get her life together enough to hold the job again. If you build her the house as well, she promises that it's going to be a fresh start for her and that better things are still to come. Finally, we have the bad to evil. While Pelican Town is a pretty friendly place, there are a few residents whose actions give us pause. First up is the honorable mention of the Old Mariner. He's barely in the game, showing up only in the unlockable portion of the beach on days when it's raining. He also provides a great service to you mechanically speaking by selling you a mermaid pendant which will allow you to marry the NPC of your choosing. What rubs a lot of players the wrong way is that he judges whether or not you're ready to get wed. The audacity! See, from a mechanical game standpoint, it makes sense that you wouldn't have a chance to buy the mermaid pendant until you need it, but from a personality standpoint, it's a bit off-putting to have a mysterious beach stranger weighing in on your personal life. As you're likely to see in this tier, a lot of the biggest NPC crimes boil down to making the player character uncomfortable, gatekeeping important resources, and not minding their own business. And speaking of off-putting, our next slot goes to Mayor Lewis. He is undoubtedly one of the most helpful NPCs in the game for your character. Unfortunately, the most useful game mechanics often come at the price of being unrealistic and borderline concerning if you stop to think about them for too long. Take the shipping bins, for instance. The default shipping bin is a large box directly outside your home where you can dump all the items you mean to sell. Mayor Lewis tells you immediately that he's going to come by each night to collect things from the bins. Considering we never see him do it, the implication is that he's going through the bin past 2 a.m every morning. The system is strange on its own, but becomes truly creepy with the introduction of miniature shipping bins for inside the house. See, the implication here, of course, is that Mayor Lewis comes into your house while you, your spouse, and any children you may have are sleeping to take things from the shipping bin and sell them. 
It's just weird. With speculation aside, Mayor Lewis also isn't great at his job. He's good at the part where he's a mailman, but he seems to do very little else. Of course, it wouldn't be a lively, intricate game if you weren't settling disputes, running errands, and figuring out the long existing problems of the town. Unfortunately, a lot of these things fall under the jurisdiction of a mayor. Even when he's hosting the town's festivals and events, he often turns to you, the new farmer. For guidance. Incompetence and strangeness are their own things, but his treatment of Marnie is another. He refuses to make their hidden affair public, despite the fact that she wants to. The secrecy is obviously having an impact on Marnie, who is over the moon with him, and Jazz, who it's implied heavily has seen him hiding in the house. Like with his professional affairs, you end up in his personal affairs as well, needing to retrieve his shorts from Marnie's home. What makes it worse is the excuse he gives her, that he thinks their relationship would undermine his work as mayor. Why does he think that? How would it undermine anything? What exactly does he do as mayor? These are questions that we may never have answers to, but honestly, we think Marnie and her frustrating business hours deserve a lot better. Following him is Krobus. He is the one friendly monster of the game. He's a shadow person living in the sewers. He's a very useful NPC to know and befriend, but it's worth mentioning that he is still friends with the other violent monsters. This pulls his character deeply into question, and we wouldn't have felt right without mentioning him on this list. Taking the bronze medal of evil is Morris. This may be a surprising one, as he's often painted as the main antagonist of the game. Symbolically, he's meant to represent all that's evil in the world. He's manager of the Joja Mart and is doing his best to let the Pelican Town succumb to the temptation of the soul-sucking corporation you left the city to avoid. It's not all uncommon to hear people referring to their Joja save file as the evil run, which, hey, it's fair. His chain store is running the little guys out of business and could cost the livelihood of several residents. Morris seems like the bad guy. If you stick it to Joja Mart and go the community center route, there's even a wholesome cutscene where the entire town bands together to boycott his store and promise to buy local. Of course, depending on which dialogue option you choose, that scene might get a little violent, ending with the townspeople encouraging violence against Morris. While well, it can be satisfying to defeat an in-game enemy, many players feel it's a step too far. Furthermore, when you look at it from his perspective, none of what he's doing is that bad. Jojo Mart does offer a lot of conveniences that many of the townspeople succumb to, even if the player character boycotts. Sam and Shane both have shifts there, and it's sort of a big deal that many of the Pelican Town residents shop there, either for their prices or selection. It would be unfair to blame Morris as an individual for something that most of the town is guilty of. Supporting Joja Mart. The fact that he supports it avidly just means he believes in it more and has been taken in deeper to the corporate mindset. Even you, yes, you, the player character, opened the game working for Joja. No one is innocent of this. And when you look at it from his perspective, he's really just doing his job. There are a few of his business practices that mean we still have to hold him accountable. One is offering Joja coupons while on the premises of the general store. That's an aggressive and pretty sleazy marketing technique. When you look at him and what he symbolizes in the context of the game, it's not at all unreasonable to call him the villain, but we also don't think it's unreasonable to say there are a couple of characters whose actions go above symbolism and into actual shady practices. On that note, the Silver Medal of Evil goes to Pierre. For a game that's supposed to be about breaking away from the soul-sucking culture of corporations, hustling hard is a theme so big in Pelican Town, it borders on problematic. The main culprit of taking things too far is Pierre. First of all, it's worth mentioning that he's the character who will actually assault Morris if encouraged to do so in the aforementioned community center cutscene. This does make sense, as his business is the one being directly targeted and nearly replaced by the Joja Mart, but we think Pierre's relationship to his business generally is unhealthy. He's the only NPC, aside from arguably Mayor Lewis, who works through the festivals. This cuts down into his already very limited family time, and he makes it clear that he puts more energy into running his shop than taking care of his family. He also tries to scam you, the player. In one of the special order requests, Pierre has the bright idea to sell organic produce, but since he can't grow organic produce, he tries to underpay you for yours, and then sell it at a marked up price. We understand that sometimes stores are the middleman. That's already how the shipping bin system is supposed to work, but the fact that it's a special order, meaning you get paid less for the ingredients, and then they're still overpriced? That's terrible, especially since he tries to take credit for your work as well. Before expecting you to fix his mistakes, 
when the crops don't sell. But still, there is one NPC we found more questionable. The Gold Medal of Evil goes to Marlin. Again, on paper, he seems like a great NPC. He forms the Adventurer's Guild and has a mission to protect Pelican Town from any hostile creatures pouring out of the mines. He gives the players their first sword and a warning about the dangers within. He offers bounties, quests, and even tries to make Gil be social to you. But also, he runs the most nefarious scheme in all of Stardew. In our Stardew Valley Spouses script, we talked a little about how Harvey gets his money not by billing you, but by essentially picking your pocket when you're found unconscious. Well, Marlin has something similar, but it's actually a little worse. If you run out of health in the mines, you'll learn that Marlin's business practice is to essentially sell your own items back to you. It's called a recovery service, but you're not paying him to go down into the mines to get your items from where you dropped them. They were brought up with you, taken off your person, and are sitting in his shop to be sold back to you. From a design perspective, it's a way to balance the game by adding stakes to combat. From a neighborly perspective, it's theft and extortion. And that's been it. Our list of Stardew Valley NPCs ranked from good to evil. Who do you think is the best behaved NPC? Let us know in the comments down below, as well as what other topics you'd like to see us cover. And if you need a one-up, make sure to hit that notification bell. And as always, thank you for watching.